Golf Smarter. Number 602 is brought to you by SmarterPodcasts.com, home of Golf Smarter, Good Dog, the Affordable Housing Podcast, and Radio Baseball Cards. Each week during the baseball season, we've been featuring the greatest players of the 20th century, sharing amazing and amusing stories from their lives in the game. But this month, Radio Baseball Cards is coming to you twice each week because we're featuring incredible stories about Jackie Robinson's breaking down of the color barrier with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. Hear what his teammates, opponents, and admirers said about his impact on their lives, the game, and our country. So please check out Radio Baseball Cards, hosted by Don Drysdale, and Good Dog, hosted by Joanne Green, from wherever you get your favorite podcasts. The Four Skills of Putting, Reading, Aiming, Stroke, and Pace, with Putting Zone founder, Jeff Mangum. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jeff Mangum. Hey there, Fred. How y'all doing? I'm doing well, my friend. It has been such a long time since you've been on the podcast, and I'm really uh, quite embarrassed by it. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I mean, like, you were on a half a dozen times between 2006 and 2012, and then you've been on the road working your brains out ever since, and I just have trouble catching up with you. Oh, it's okay. We're, we're good. We're good. Yeah, man. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> I need because it's been a long time. There's a lot of people who are hearing golf smarter, hearing about you for the first time. Please explain to us your expertise and what it is that you travel around from golf course to golf course doing. Okay, well, I started the putting zone in 2000, which is uh, putting only expertise. After 10 years of study from 1990 to 2000. Uh, before that, I was a lawyer for almost 20 years, and then I got out of law, and I had plenty of time on my hands, so I started studying golf, and I immediately recognized that golf is 95% full swing only, and I was never going to be the ball-beating world beater, so I just picked David Ledbetter in 1990 as my guru and just went with that. There are 40,000 other picks to choose from. <laughs> yeah. Then I turned my attention to putting, and kind of find out that there's only 5% available in all the literature, all the golf magazines, all the websites, all the books, all the videos and DVDs. There's only 5% of golf's instructional effort focused on putting, and that 5% is unusually bad. It's inconsistent. It's vague. It's overlapping. It's self-contradictory. It's amateurish. It's pros used to write books in the 50s and 60s about whatever their stroke was and why. And it was like just kind of worthless. Yeah. That project, project uh, inv involved me reading everything that I could possibly find in the history of golf instruction from the 1870s to today about putting in all the magazines, all the books, all the tapes and videos, all the DVDs, all the websites, everything I could find. That's a five to six year project. At the conclusion of which, um, it dawned on me that there are four skills of putting and that the 5% of putting instruction didn't even know there's four to learn and teach. The, everybody teaches stroke. The four skills of putting are reading the putt, aiming the putter according to the read, and then stroking wherever you have aimed your putter face for line control and stroking with the pace control that matches the read that you uh, saw or imagined to begin with. Those four skills have to be taught A, as an integrated system, and B, in terms of the knowledge of how the body actually performs those perception and movement skills. So nobody's teaching it. So there's nobody teaching reading putts in the literature except for a guy in Texas named H.A. Uh, Templeton, a, an Air Force colonel that spent two years applying his computer skills and physics knowledge and his love of golf to come up with a little system of aim charts. He did that in 1984. 
Um, the PGA instruction manual written by uh, Dr. Gary Wyron in the 80s, that was the only source that Dr. Gary Wyron knew to even refer to for reading putts. And even though it's in the PGA instruction manual in the 80s, uh, I've never met a PGA member who took that class that even has ever heard of Dr. Templeton. Hmm. So reading putts is a big, you know, big nothing. Or as they say today, a nothing burger. <laughs> um, <laughs> who says that? <laughs> those people in Washington, D.C. <laughs> big league. Poo -pooing, poo pooing some criticism or something. <laughs> but at any rate, um, you know, to teach reading a putt with simple little silly stuff like imagine pouring a bucket of water on the green, you know, okay, yeah. big deal. How does that work? How does it work in the body? How does the body see slope? How does the body see distance? How does the body imagine a ball rolling over a green contour in a curve path going in the hole with the right speed? All right, so they don't teach that. Nobody teaches aiming. In fact, there's two kinds of aiming skills. One is to point your putter according to the line that you think is the start line. The second skill is to look at any putter from beside the ball and determine or perceive accurately sideways, however long far off you have to go, what grass blade that putter face actually points at. It's two completely different skills. Mm -hmm. Second skill, uh, I'm the only person in the history of golf who even really talks about that one. There used to be a little gimmick in the 50s that, that – uh, golfers did to see the line of the putt by putting their eyes over the ball and the back of their head flat to the surface, parallel to the surface, and then turn their heads like a, an apple on a stick so that the axis of their neck turn and their gaze were perpendicular. And that would actually run your vision in a straight line sideways away from the putter face. They didn't know all that, and they specifically, they didn't know that it's the perpendicular relationship of your eye beam to your neck turn that is the key to running your eyesight in a straight line sideways. The skill for running your eyes straight sideways is how you determine where a putter face aims, or indeed where a driver or seven iron aims. So that skill, the putting zone, is basically the only teaching in the history of golf about that. Stroke, uh, everybody's got an opinion. Daddy did it. Grandpa taught me. I won with this. I'm an amateur, and I was sitting on a toilet in Chicago in 1940, and I had a great idea. <laughs> or I'm a golf illustrator named Paul Trevelyan, and if I bend over real far like Michelle Wee, I can make a four-foot putt, and I'll bet you $10,000 you can't <laughs> do more than me. You know, 1970s stuff. And so stroke is, like, ludicrous. I'm not even going to. I'm not wondering what people say about stroke until I see that they're teaching four skills. Hmm. The message of the stroke is if you don't say the stroke is designed to effectuate the purpose of starting the ball, wherever your putter face is aimed, you're not talking sense at all. And nobody does that. Hmm. I'll say, you know, forward press and get true roll, blah, 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 blah. Completely divorced from the aim of the putter face. And so you know, in modern times, uh, some people sort of backed into putt where your putter face aims by, uh, by accident, by teaching physics, square face at impact, blah, blah, blah. Those, those sort of teachings sort of implicitly send the ball where the putter face has been aimed, but not, they don't really say it out loud. So the skill of what it is you're trying to do with the stroke is woefully absent in the history of golf. That's kind of a sad commentary on the history of golf. Distance control, ain't nobody know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nobody know nothing. Come on, Jordan well, Spieth knows something. Uh, no, Jordan <laughs> Spieth don't know nothing. He had five three putts in the British Open in 2000, whatever, 15, 16 or something. That's bad. That's a guy that doesn't know how to stop the bleeding. Oh. That's a guy that doesn't have the knowledge in the head to tell an 11 year old how to do distance control. And if you read his interviews after the rounds and you say, well, what was the problem? His answer is, I don't know. Hmm. Go read the interviews. I've read them. I got them. I'll send them to you. 
He does not understand how the body does distance control. He's got tips and drills. And that's it. But to explain a skill, to have knowledge of a skill, is to be able to explain it to an 11-year-old. And if you can't explain it to an 11-year-old, you don't have it in your head. You might have a talent like Jordan Spieth. But unless you have more than a talent, you don't have a skill. And that missing ingredient is how does the body do it correctly? There might be more than one way to get something done, more than one way to skin a cat. But in terms of technique, you want to understand what's a good way that works with the innate processes of the human body. Well, that's kind of beyond golf guys because they're sitting in the 19th hole sucking down beers instead of studying human anatomy, physiology, brain science, and all that stuff. So at the end of five or six years of looking at what golf has served up for these skills, the answer is a whole bunch about stroke and next to nothing about anything else. I was at the sad point of either quitting <laughs> or solving the problems myself. Let me now, guess. This is where I... <laughs> yeah, this is where I, I come out sounding like an egotistical maniac. Okay, let me be the champ egotistical maniac of all golf history. I solved the problems of putting by many years of scientific investigation, observation, study, work on the greens by hours and hours and years and years to come up with what actually is the answer for how the skills work for distance control for reading putts, for aiming putters, and for a sensible stroke that starts balls where you aim. And I'm proud of that. And I don't want anybody to mistake it. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to prove it. And if you think otherwise, show me any inkling of proof otherwise, because I've already been there. <laughs> There's, I've read everything there is to read, and it is it's just ludicrous that people hadn't been solving these problems. Oh, All right, so I, I basically been... solved the problems. Now, I've been teaching that stuff since 2000 in public, but basically I didn't really get hot until about 2005, 2008. Just when we started having you on the show. And you, well, were, yeah. you were smoking yeah. hot. Smoking hot. <laughs> smoking <laughs> hot. <laughs> I wrote a book called Optimal Putting, Brain Science and the Four Skills of Putting. Uh, brain Science Instincts and the Four Skills of Putting, which is applying brain science, human anatomy, uh, motorsports expertise for skill development, that sort of stuff, plus greens agronomy and the entire history of what everybody else has suggested about the skills of putting and put it in a book. And that book sold out in, in a few months in hand to hand sales, no internet sales or any of that, just hand to hand. Wow. And, um, that was held as the best books ever written in putting. So if you want to check it out, um, the, the used copies, there are four used copies on Amazon.com right now. Two of them are $200, one of them is $650, and one of them is $2,600. What? Really? Yeah. Why? <laughs> what? Nobody gets my book back to the used. <laughs> for $2,600? For credit. Yeah, $2,600 is one of them. W what is it for a new one? You got a written one that's sold out. Wait, so it's not available? No, it's sold out. Well, why aren't you printing more? Because I'm not rich enough to, to fund it. You well, all you have to do is sell one used it. one to make enough money to fund it. <laughs> well, I'm, I just don't do that. I've got a PDF that I give away for free. Oh. Uh, you know, so the 280-some page. Some people can buy it, and that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll take the 10 bucks or whatever it is. But, you know, other people can sell my book for, in the PDF format. That's fine. You know, I let them keep whatever they can get selling it. One guy made $5,000 selling my book in a six-month period. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So, well, anyway. Proof once again that I'm a lousy businessman. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm even worse than you because I don't really care. You know? <laughs> I just want to, I want to teach children and, and up-and-coming amateurs. That's who I want to teach. All right. right. Well, so now, you, now that we've got the, your four skills of putting required, I, I, I just hear questions screaming out to sure. me from other people Jump like, in. okay, Jump so right it seems that Aimpoint Express is very popular these days. Um, I'm glad for them. And, and I'm sure that you have an opinion of that level of instruction. Sure. 
Well, it's a gusset up version of plumb bobbin. Plumb bobbin is not a skill. It's just sort of some kind of crutch to sort of get you more or less right. Um, aim point is assumed is based on the modeling of physics for putting. A model erases all the particular circumstances and makes everything perfectly uniform. The model that calculates aims in aim point assumes that the, perf the surface is perfectly flat. The green speed is known with exact detailed number. The green speed is homogeneous from beginning to end and doesn't vary during the aim point of the putt. The putt is hit perfectly. There's no skidding or bouncing, blah, 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 blah. That's what a model does. It shaves out all the irregularities of the actual situation and calculates an aim based on the physics. Aim point express is basically sticking your finger up in the air to use a little uh, Boy Scout trigonometry to figure out where exactly you should point your putter based on the calculations. Now, that's all aim point does. It doesn't teach you how to read a putt. It doesn't teach you how to aim your putter even if you know where the target is. It doesn't teach you how to do the pace control and it doesn't teach you how to stroke straight where you aim. It sort of gets you kind of right, but then it leaves you with nothing to make the read more exact or to execute the read and it only works when there's the same flatness of the surface from ball to hole and any kind of time where you get too far away from the hole where there's a change in the surface shape aim point is uh, ruled out because it only applies to those very simple cases hmm. aim point probably does not apply in 70 percent of putts outside 10 feet but they're they're teaching it successfully now when, well i'm glad they're teaching it successfully but basically they're depriving people from learning the skill mm -hmm. if you ask anybody that teaches aim point do you realize that this is just a stop gap kind of limited halfway measure that is not actually a skill and they go they'll argue with you for half an hour then they'll say yeah hmm. and you say, well what do you got to make the read more exact and to help the golfers execute the putt better and the answer is blah 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 they argue with you for half an hour and then they admit nothing that's not good all right so that's the first critique is that it's a gimmick instead of a skill mm. and it's not really all that good of a gimmick if your calculation is based on a certain ball speed that the player can't execute the calculation is wrong if the putting the finger up in the air is not done correctly the angle that you aim your putter face is wrong so even if you could aim even if you could do straight strokes and stuff like that aim point is not good enough now let me tell you what kind of precision is required so you'll kind of get frightened by this if you have a dead straight 10 foot putt that's 120 inches to the center of the hole from the ball to the center of the hole 120 inches is 10 feet the hole is 4.25 inches in diameter from left to right. And so from the center of the cup to the right edge of the cup is two and a quarter, two and one eighth of an inch or 2.125 inches. Now, if you make a triangle from the ball, 120 inches to the center of the hole, side one, side two is two and an eighth inch to the right, to the right edge of the hole. And side three is the hypotenuse back to the ball. And you say that little angle at the ball in that triangle is the maximum mistake you can make for aim and for stroke, or otherwise you're going to miss a dead straight 10 foot putt by a half of a cup and you'll miss it to the right edge. What is that angle? The angle is one degree. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you aimed your putter face straight down the 120 inches at the dead center of the hole, and then you rotated your toe of your putter to the right, how far would that toe move from beginning to end of rotation 
to make a one degree swing? The answer to that is one fourth of a tenth of an inch. It's pretty small. A, bl a grass blade is about a tenth of an inch from side to side. Yeah. And you're talking about one fourth of a grass blade wrong for your aim or your, for your stroke and your, your one half of a cup wrong in the way you're going to putt. All right. Now in aim point, the fingers of individuals are not measured. The finger is supposed to be the far tiny little piece of a triangle that is based on physics about the calculated read. A 1% slope by my empirical testing breaks one half of an inch for every foot and one inch for every two feet. So if you make a break triangle similar to the 10 foot putt triangle, the break triangle is 24 inches from, from beginning to, to center cup and then one inch to the aim spot to the right, say a right to left break and putt. So the triangle is 24 inches, one inch, and then a hypotenuse. And what is that angle at the ball? The answer is 2.38 degrees. Aim point does not know this because they don't do empirical testing. They do calculated breaks. Now, if I wanted to make a, a fake triangle by sticking my finger up, the first question is, is how thick is my finger from left to right edge, say an index finger. The second question is how far away from my eyeball should I put that? Now they don't even, they're not even going for the triangle that I'm talking to you about the 124, 124 triangle. If your finger was one inch thick from left to right, you would put it 24 inches from your eyeball. And then you would see an angle where the center of the cup is on the left edge of your finger and the right edge of your finger is, is the aim spot for that break. That would be a 2.38 degree angle and show you exactly where a 1% slope break would be on the ground. They don't know that because they don't, they don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. People's fingers are not one inch from left to right. They're much closer to one to, uh, to three fourths of an inch. Mm -hmm. And so if they're three fourths of an inch, where would you put your finger? They don't teach that. What they teach is that you change the distance of your finger based on green speed. Hmm. That's kind of weird hmm. because green speed is making approximately, if you go from a stemp 10 to a stemp 11 green, a faster green, you're going to have a larger break, but that's a 10% difference in green speed. How would you make a 10% difference in the angle of your finger triangle <laughs> what's the 10% difference in 2.38? Basically 2.6. How far do you move your finger? They got no idea how to do that. <laughs> it's not, it ain't even, it ain't even close to what's happening. All right. So that's like the flaws of aim point. There's a whole lot better, stupider way to do this. So let me, let me just get into the sunshiny beachy, wonderful world of putting zone and tell you how to actually do this. Right. But let, let me ask you this. So, so basically we're human beings. We're not iron Byron and we won't make the exact same stroke every time. So right. it, is putting, can it be an exact science when it's just all human uh, instigated? Well, that question sort of assumes that the human is not as good as the science. So let me kind of disentangle that little confusion a little bit. Okay. Human instincts are better than math. Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> the aim point is just numbers that you're sort of right about. You're not really measuring stuff with your ankles for slope. I've, I've never met anybody who's 
very accurate with their ankles to tell me what slope they're standing on. Yeah, I've, had, think I've struggled with that they one. They how to, how to stand boy, on a green and tell me what the angle is. That, that's been yeah, you difficult. put down a little instrument, man, they're way 20% off. Yeah. Easy. I mean, those are the good ones. All right. So, you know, they don't know the green speed. This They're just wild guessing numbers. They don't know the ball speed. They're wild guess. They don't know the distance. They don't know the flatness of the surface. Okay, so numbers are fake science. They're not exact. And you can't get exact because you, it's illegal to get down on your hands and knees and measure stuff when you're in the middle of a round of golf. Illegal, not skillful. Fortunately, an astute use of the body can be better than the math because it deals with the facts as they are. You perceive things as they are, whatever they are, steepness of slope, speed of green, distance, facts, not numbers. You don't substitute some halfway number for a fact. You live with the fact itself as it is. And you deal with that fact skillfully. And when you start dealing with the fact skillfully as taught in the putting zone, the instinctive engagement with the surface for reading the putt gives you an answer better than aim point, more accurate than aim point, better science than aim point, And it corrects the halfway reads of stuff like aim points or just gimmicks. So the putting zone teaches two phases of reading. Number one, if you are on the same plane of tilt, a flat surface at the same slope angle from ball all the way to hole, then you can use some dumbed down halfway accurate approximate math to get in the ballpark. The second level is you start using your instincts to fine tune that mathematical halfway approximate read and make a final executive decision on how high to aim your putter off straight at the hole to the high side. The instinctive reading in the putting zone is taught by imaginations of three different types of movies of ball speed going to the hole. Those movies all coincide. They all agree. They're all a lot tighter correlated than, than the, the mathematics stuff. And they always, almost always, adjust the math a little bit. The math is kind of okay so long as you're on the same flatness from ball to hole. But if you get off on a long putt, you only have the instinctive reading that will help you. Aim point doesn't help you on long putts where there's more than one slope between the ball and the hole. Hills, valleys, humps, tiers, any of that, aim point is out, ruled out. Don't use it. So what do you got? You need to come see me at the putting zone or one of the 350 <laughs> certified teachers who have solved these problems and teach it to 11-year-olds. So wait, you have 150 teachers using your program now? You want 350. 350. That's, yeah, I've been 30. contacted by many. That's amazing. Right. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. They're still growing. This is growing like crazy in, um, in uh, France right now. Really? Yeah. Probably 25 or 30 over there now. Wow. Wow. It's like Congratulations. Or so in Sweden. There's 45 in Spain. It's all over the place. But, you know, let me tell you about the movies, the instinctive movies. Sure. Or, or I'll, we'll, we'll back up. Putting Zone taught the math first, way before Aim Point. We've been trying to help Aim Point by telling them about H.A. Templeton did, did all this stuff better than, than they did. Plus, he wrote a 200-page book filled with physics to explain what he did. But it's still, math is, is not really the deal. Math is only about right approximately right and only applies when it's the same flatness from ball to hole. But there's a simpler way to do the math than the silly fingers and ankle stuff. The simple way to do the math is just the empirical testing says 1% slope is going to break one inch for every two feet. 
that means the 2% slope is going to break uh, two inches for every four feet. I think that's right. 1% um, slope breaks a half of an inch for every foot. A 2% slope breaks one inch for every foot. A 3% slope breaks one and a half inches for every foot of putt. And a 4% slope breaks two inches for every foot of putt. All right, so you got a 2% slope and six feet of putt is going to break six inches. That's a normal green speed, a flat surface from ball to hole. But you don't measure the green speed, you don't measure the distance, you don't measure the flatness, and you don't really measure the slope. So those numbers are kind of funny. They're approximate. If you can look at a slope and say, that looks like a 2% slope, that's a good skill to have, but it's just familiarity. Do it five times and then don't worry about your ankles. Just look at the slope and say, that's about a two, that's about a one, that's about a three. Then you can go through this math in a, in a quick way because it's not life or death stuff. It's just ballparking you and getting you ready to do the next thing, which is instinctive reading. So there's a silly little formula for, for putts. You know, there's a way to fine tune your skill of reading the degree of uh, the angle. And that is if you have an iPhone, I don't know if they do it on Android, but oh. in the iPhone, there's right. an app called Compass. And right. one gives you the compass of north, south, east, west. But if you flip, you know, you slide one screen to the right, it gives you a, a level. And it tells you by degrees. Well. Let me tell you what a science guy like myself says about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeff, I just set you up. I, boy, did I just throw a softball at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, I got you. I got it. Thanks. Dude, we only have about five minutes left here because we both have to get going. So well, I know I that's wanna, not going to be easy for you. Point. I just I want to I want to talk about the positive stuff. Yeah, please. The technology of the iPhone only samples the exact area of the green underneath the iPhone. That's not good enough for golfers because you need basically a hundred inch sample of the surface. Mm. And, and if you move the iPhone around from spot to spot on the same green, you know, six inches, right, 10 inches left and all that, you're going to get a whole wide variety of, of numbers out of your technology. So that uh, iPhone sampling uh, promises the moon and delivers a little chunk of green cheese. Then never mind. That's all right. But, the, the movies are the, these are the following movies real quick. These are instinctive movies that apply to any putt. Number one, make a, a, a straight line in your mind from the bottom of the ball to the center of the hole. That'll call a baseline. The baseline divides the green universe into a low side and a high side. Just imagining that line from ball to the center of the cup makes it easier to decide which way is uphill, downhill, all right? Second line, from the center of the cup, follow the fall line, make that line. So those two lines always intersect in the center of the cup and they make a corner. The high side is always in the corner. And the only question for the read is, what's the angle you turn your putter face from the center of the hole to the high side? Mathematically, you can do it with simple little formulas like, okay, a 2% slope breaks one inch per foot, and I've got a seven and a half inch, well, a seven and a half foot putt, so I'm going to aim seven and a half inches from the center of the cup straight up the fall line. If you measured seven and a half inches from the center of the cup straight up the fall line, you're going to have a T peg to aim at five and a half inches out of the center of the cup, or out of the top edge of the cup, I mean. Now, if you can point your putter face, great. If you can't, you're going to miss. If you don't have a good stroke, you're going to, probably going to miss. If you don't have pace control, you're probably going to miss. The movies are the following using those two lines, the baseline and the fall line. First movie, imagine how low a ball breaks when you start it only down the baseline at the center of the cup with perfect ball speed. It'll break to the low side, and then when it crosses the fall line, it's got about two, maybe one, two, or three more rolls left in it before it stops completely. But the point where it crosses below the hole on the fall line, below the hole, 
if you measured from that crossing point back to the center of the cup and then aimed exactly that many inches to the high side, that goes in the cup, center cut. Movie number one. Okay, if you did a movie like that and compared it to the math, it might say aim seven and three quarters of an inch instead of seven and a half. The second movie is to imagine in the corner how a ball will actually cross the lip center cut headed to the flag stick hole. A center cut putt by definition when it crosses the lip of the cup is headed dead to the center of the bottom of the cup. Now, if you just imagined the fall line, that's one possible entry and the baseline is the other possible entry. Those are the extreme ways that balls could conceivably go in, but that's not real because of ball speed. So when you imagine accurate ball speed, good ball speed, smart ball speed coming in from the high side into the corner, going over the lip center cut, you can put your finger down and say, this is where the ball goes in the cup. Now, if you replace that little trajectory into the center of the cup with a little toy matchbook car and back the car up along the curve back to the ball, however many feet away, the start line follows the headlights of that backing up car. And those headlights, they will shine as far as the fall line back at the hole and identify a spot on the fall line. And guess what? That spot will be the same as imagined in the first movie, about seven, three quarters inches or so. That's because both imaginations are using exactly the same ball speed and the brain is dealing with it is what it is, whatever it is, for slope and green speed and distance and flatness. The third movie that joins in there and confirms these first two is a feel way to read break. First, you aim dead down the baseline. You say, I know that won't be a good aim because those go low. Then you rotate your putter face slightly to the high side and you imagine how far that putt would go before it crosses the baseline to the low side. You say maybe it goes halfway. Then you rotate your face open a little more and imagine again, perfect ball speed. How far will that go before it grows to the low side of the baseline? Maybe three fourths of the way. Then you rotate your face open a little more and see if that'll go all the way to the hole when you execute with perfect ball speed and a straight stroke. When you finish that process, if your putter face then had headlights on it, like the car in the second movie, and you turned your headlights on to see where they shined onto the fall line, it confirms the first two reads because all three of those reads are using the same ball speed. A second variety of the same last movie is to turn the putter face from dead center down the baseline slightly to the, to the high side, but knowing that it's not enough to the high side and then see if your body reacts in a certain way. The body will always react to that by going, the only way you can keep that putt with this low line, not high enough line on the high side of the baseline is if you violate the prime directive and don't use perfect ball speed but hit the ball faster, harder. Your body will go, got to hit it harder and to keep it on the high side. That feeling is golden because it tells you one clear thing. Aim higher until that feeling goes away. Hmm. And so you aim a little higher and incrementally you sneak up on that moment when that feeling completely dissipates. And when that feeling of needing to add speed goes away, you're locked and loaded, put exactly where you aim, no special ball speed other than the usual smart ball speed is the only plan that could possibly sink that putt. Now, wow. PJ Tour players, they do this all the time, but they can't teach it to an 11-year-old like I just did. That's why I'm wearing the crown, boys. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you don't kiss my butt. I ain't teaching you. <laughs> well, I'm only no. 10, so I still don't get it. <laughs> this is, this is exactly what I love about podcasting versus radio <laughs> is that we can take this episode. I know that I will and listen to it over and over again until I get it. 
Well, your, your stuff you is know, so dense. That's what I love about it. It's well, so, it all it all it all hubs back down to do you have the skill for ball speed? Right. Jordan it's, Spieth has talent, but he doesn't have the knowledge of how it works. Yeah. Wow. So rhythm and tempo, that's another lesson. But if you know how ball speed works, then you have a smart ball speed. You're familiar with it. You imagine only with that ball speed. And then you, you always, there's no compromise on the ball speed. The ball speed sets the curve. The curve sets the start line. The start line is not negotiable either. Once you're locked in on the start line, there's only plan A. Start it where you aimed with the usual ball speed. What is all this business about being anxious about a four foot putt to win the Masters? There's only plan A. Read the hell, read the heck out of it. Aim accurately. Check your body for feelings to see if you're you're off base, and then pull the trigger. And put it at the bottom of the cup. That's right. Or, all right. or miss. All right. So we're going to have to have you come back and, and and we'll go over rhythm and tempo. Sure. Love it. All right. Yeah, man. Anytime. All right, buddy. Hey, man, it's so good to talk to you again. <laughs> yeah, nice to talk to you. <laughs> Breath like, of fresh air out here in the East Coast to hear from you guys out in California. Where are you? I'm in North Carolina. You're in New North Blue, Carolina. North okay. Carolina, Carolina University. Yep. We're having a big old time here. Awesome. I'm, yeah, I'm living in a great big old farm, boy. Nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. Well, okay, and then so puttingzone.com, and then if people want to get that free PDF from you, how do they sure. get it? Give me an email. Just uh, jeff.mangum at gmail, and that's G E O F F. And Mangum is M A N G U M. Right. Just put a dot between first and last name at gmail and ask for. I, got, I also have um, about uh, 25 different free texts that I send out on specific skills. There you go. Distance control, drills, stroke control, reading. Well, Mr. Mangum, I loved hearing from you. I love the lesson, and I love learning what I shouldn't be paying attention to. (laughs) Everybody, be well, and we'll talk again soon and go over rhythm and tempo, okay? All right, Fred. Thank you. Bye-bye. Up next, contact is king. If you heard episode number 599 with YouTuber Brendan DeVore, He talked about his favorite teacher and video partner, Tim Yelverton. Well, I tracked him down. (laughs) Tim joins us to talk about how to master your wedge play from 50 yards and in, plus more tips and drills to improve your putting skills. Once again, I'd like to request that you write a review for Golf Smarter in iTunes or the Apple Podcast app, and follow us at Golf Smarter on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And don't forget, the free Golf Smarter app for iOS or Android is available to get access to our entire archives and be notified when each new episode is available on your mobile device as soon as it's published. (laughs) Also, have I told you that we have a Golf Smarter TV channel? It's a robust YouTube channel that includes golf tips, drills, advice, reviews, and some of these podcast interviews. Find all this at golfsmarter.com.